All right, let's begin our time with a word of prayer. God, we come to you this morning eager to hear from you, eager to sit under your word, eager to have our hearts reset, uh, to have our thinking uh, rearranged, recalibrated uh, according to the truth of things. And we just thank you for the opportunity to gather with your people and uh, to have the, the rich privilege of having a big view of you which has ramifications for how we view ourselves. And we pray for that this morning. Uh, by the work of your spirit, through the instrumentality of your word, to get us to think rightly about ourselves in view of who you are. That we might give you all praise and all glory for all things at all times. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this morning is installation number five of Salvation 101. Uh, there will be a 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, somewhere down the road. Uh, but next week's equipping hour is really exciting. Omri Miles will be starting a series called Blood for Clarity. And you want to make sure to be a part of that. I'll explain a little bit more of that during our welcome time in the main service. But this is part five of Salvation 101. And we're sort of turning over the diamond of salvation in our hand and looking at all the facets and letting them shine brilliantly. And as uh, an introduction this morning, I want you to think about driving outside of the city, driving across the, the desert, or if you're in the Midwest, driving across prairie land. When you get outside of populated areas, you start to get a sense of how vast space is, how big the earth is, how much room there is around it. And we've lived under the threat of population overload on this planet, right? We hear the scare stories about how many people are on the earth and the earth can't sustain it. And a number of years ago, I heard the statistic that if every human being on the earth, nearly 7 billion people on the earth, all stood on the island of Maui with their arms outstretched, they could all stand on the island without touching each other. In other words, there's a lot of space on the earth. It's just big. And when you drive from major population center to major population center, you realize there's a lot of space in between. Lots of things to see, lots of little nooks and crannies. And when you get on the American freeway system or the interstate system, uh, you recognize that you're only seeing a thin band. But if you get above, when you fly over, especially the desert southwest, and you just see, oh, that thin little band of, of I-10, I, I only could see what was around that. There's so much more to see. It's just big. And it's important for us to feel small sometimes, to, to get out in those open spaces and realize we're just not as big as we thought we were. And it's good to stand below a mountain and feel small. It's good to be on the ocean and feel really small. The light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. It takes eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to the earth. We're 186,000 miles per second times eight minutes away from the sun. From the sun to Jupiter is five times that distance. The sun to Saturn is nine and a half times that distance. And we're just talking about our neighbors in our little solar system here, circling around one little star. The closest star besides our sun is the three-star complex of Alpha Centauri. It is 4.3 light years away. In other words, it takes light at 186,000 miles per second, 4.3 years to get there. And if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you some 100,000 to 200,000 years to go from one end of our galaxy to the other. That's just our galaxy. Our galaxy is one of perhaps 100 million, some say 200 million galaxies in the visible universe. And that's a guess because the Milky Way galaxy itself obscures our view. We're kind of out on one little, our sun is out on a tail of a spiral galaxy. And we can't really see through the center of the Milky Way galaxy to see what's beyond it. But we look out at the other angles and we sort of do math and multiply. If there's this many galaxies in this quadrant, then we multiply that out and guess somewhere between 100 million and 200 million galaxies. And, and the Milky Way galaxy has some really close neighbors in a cluster, but outside of our local galaxy neighborhood, the closest galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy, and it is... Seven, uh, sorry, it is two and a half million light years away. 
But numbers cease to make sense. And if the nearest galaxy, Andromeda, is two and a half million light years away, and it's just one of the hundreds of millions of galaxies in the universe, you start to get a sense of the scale of the universe. Things that we can observe and things that we can measure are just vast. And by the way, if you run the scale the other direction, if you start to go into the micro, you, you start to look at what is really small, things that we could observe and calculate and measure. As far as the scale goes outward in bigness, it goes farther the other way in smallness. Now, why did God create the universe this way? We, we could only uh, observe a couple of realities from Scripture. We could perhaps make guesses and speculations at why God would make such a universe. But I'm convinced that one of the reasons that things are so big, so vast stretched so wide, is so that when God says through the prophet Isaiah that he holds all of it in the palm of his hand, we have a sense of the magnitude of God. And conversely, we have a sense of the punitude, <laughs> we are puny, of ourselves. There's another reason I think that's really helpful in thinking just about an astronomy lesson this morning, and it is the recognition that we are very bad astronomers. We're terrible at it. Even if we can read the textbooks and get the measurements, even if you own a telescope in your backyard, I'm telling you, you are a bad astronomer. Why? Because you are still convinced that the universe revolves around you. That's just intrinsic to who we are. We are self-absorbed by nature. We think about everything in terms of how it relates to me. And, and I want to lead into our last discussion for a while on salvation, thinking about our gross self-centeredness. And contrast that with the Bible's view of salvation. The Bible presents the doctrine of salvation as very important to the individual. God's concern is for humanity, and he has love and compassion and concern for humanity down at the individual level. It is right to understand, Christian, that God loves you. God loves you individually, personally. And yet there is something bigger and grander than that in God's plan of salvation. Salvation does not terminate with you. Salvation terminates in the glory of God. Salvation is biblically doxological. It is about God's glory. We looked at that before. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That is, my salvation is not just about little old me and God might have been lonely if I weren't there because I'm so great and God needed to have me so he did whatever it had to take to get me there. Something else is going on. And so what I want to do this morning is talk simply about the God-centeredness of salvation. And do we have slides on this? I think they're in there in the equipping hour slides. And then there's detailed notes on the web um, that give you all the verse references and things, um, the, the notes that we'll go through this morning. So you can either pull that up or look at it later. Salvation is about the glory of God. God saves sinners for his own glory. And what we want to look at first this morning is the God-centeredness of salvation. And I'm going to quote from biblical doctrine. It's a systematic theology we sell at the book table, uh, MacArthur and Mayhew and others. And they write this, the driving purpose for which God saves his people is in accordance with his ultimate purpose for all things, namely to bring glory and honor to himself. Because believers receive such immense blessings at the hand of God's saving grace, it is a common misconception to assume that God's chief regard in salvation is to sinners themselves. The privilege of being chosen by God for salvation on the basis of nothing in oneself, of being provided a substitute of such worthiness and honor as the Son of God himself, of receiving the gift of the new birth apart from any works of one's own, of being united to Christ, declared righteous apart from works, adopted into the family of God, conformed unto his image, progressively on earth and perfectly in heaven. The flood of gracious benefits that man enjoys in salvation tempts the student of Scripture to believe that God's saving love terminates ultimately on man. Scripture, however, reveals that salvation is not man-centered, but God-centered. God saves sinners 
for the praise of His glorious grace, Ephesians 1.6. So what I want to do is just trace some of the threads, some of the, the hints in Scripture at this God-centeredness of salvation, and perhaps we would have to read the whole Bible this morning from beginning to end to get the full picture of this. This truly is the message of salvation that God presents. But we just want to look at a, at a few things that lead us to this in small details. So turn in your Bibles to Exodus 2, Exodus chapter 2. And in the Exodus, we're looking at the physical salvation of Israel out of Egyptian bondage to slavery. And it becomes the prototypical metaphor in Scripture for salvation, even of a spiritual kind. And, and even the physical salvation of Israel is not removed from God's plan for the spiritual redemption from sin of His people, for God is keeping covenant with Israel, uh, as He promised, even in the Exodus. Exodus 2.23 says this, It came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning. God remembered His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice. And you have this iterated emphasis. God did this, God did this, God did this, God did this. God's people cried, they groaned, they sighed, they prayed, they complained, and God heard. What we see in this is God's compassion, His mercy, that is His view of those in a pitiable condition, and He listened. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, Hittite, Amorite, Perizzite, Hivite, Jebusite. Exodus 3.16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And you hear God's words to Moses that he has heard Israel's cry and he cares. He cares, he loves, he has compassion. Exodus 9.16 gives us something behind this compassion. He says, indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Part of the reason for Israel's continued bondage and a slow release through power from Egypt is that God had a desire to make his name great. God had a desire to put his compassions and his power, his authority, his rulership over all rulers on the earth on display before a watching world. And you know the echoes of this throughout Israel's history. Everywhere Israel went, read the conquest narratives, and everybody is saying, look, that's the people whose God smashed Egypt. We know they're coming. Rahab knew this. People were afraid because God was making his name great. Exodus 14.4, God tells us here why he is hardening Pharaoh's heart and what will be the result. Thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord and they did so. And this gets at something as a theme in the Bible that's even bigger than salvation of sinners. We talked about the first week in Salvation 101, that the theme of the Bible is not how does God save sinners, but how does God as king get glory for himself through the salvation of sinners and through the judgment of sinners. And here we see that on display. Look again at Exodus 14.4, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, he will chase after them, I will be honored through Pharaoh. How is God going to get glory? By the destruction of a recalcitrant rebel and his entire army. God's going to get glory that way. Exodus 14.17, 
As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. God is up to something in the salvation of sinners, and it is bigger than the sinners. It is bigger than those who are saved. It is bigger than those who are judged. He is working out all things for his own glory. Psalm 106, 8 says this, He saved them for the sake of his name, that he might make his power known. And turn to Isaiah 42. We're going to read seven verses and then an eighth. Starting in verse one. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and and spirit to those who walk in it. I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I will also uphold you by the hand and watch over you, and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison." Here in describing Messiah's ministry, his salvific work, and his rule on the earth. This concludes in verse 8. I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Where is all this salvation work headed? To the praise of his name, to the praise of his glory. A glory and an honor he does not share with others. God is peerless. He has no rivals. And those who worship idols and graven images will be shamed. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. Isaiah 48, 9, For the sake of my name I delay my wrath, and for my praise I restrain it for you in order not to cut you off. Isaiah 48, 11, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? Ezekiel expresses the same sentiment in Ezekiel 36. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord Yahweh, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares the Lord Yahweh, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. Why is God saving Israel? Because they deserved it? Because they had earned it? (laughs) No, because he was committed to his own glory, to his own promises, to his own honor. Daniel 9 Verse 18, Daniel prays, O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. Do you get the the impression that Daniel in Babylonian captivity had read his Bible? He knew Isaiah. He knew the Exodus. And he reflected that theology in his prayer. To the New Testament, we have the same sentiments. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 5. God predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Verse 7, according to the riches of His grace. Verse 9, 
according to his kind intention which he purposed, verse 12, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Verse 14, he has given us a pledge for our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. And finally, listen to 1 John 2, 12. The apostle writes, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. Why does God save sinners? For his own honor, for his own glory, according to his own purposes. Secondly, this morning, I want to look at Trinitarian accomplishment in salvation. This is another feature that draws us into thinking about the God-centeredness of salvation. And when we talk about Trinitarian accomplishment of salvation, we mean that each member of the Trinity, each member of the Godhead was active, participating in the salvation of sinners, all in accordance with the purpose and plan of God. In Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 3, we just summarized that section, we discover that the Father, first of all, planned redemption. The Father planned redemption. This all occurred according to His purpose, according to His will, for the praise of His glory. Listen to verse 5. He predestined us to adoption according to the kind intention of His will. The Father was the one who planned salvation of sinners. God is also the one who is said to choose or to elect believers. Look at John 6. John chapter 6. And the verses are up there on the screen. You can skim ahead. You can turn to these if you like or just listen. John 6:65. 6, and he was saying, for this reason, I said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. And of course, it was the Father who sent the Son to earth, John 3, 16. God loved the world so that what? He gave. He sent the Son. Over and over again, uh, Jesus in his earthly ministry says, I have been sent It was the Father's good pleasure, Isaiah 53.10, to crush the Son at the cross. How was the Father involved in the cross work of Jesus Christ? It was God's own justice. It was the Father's own wrath being poured out on the Son, and it pleased Him to crush His Son. Acts 2.24 makes it clear in Peter's sermon that it is the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. God the Father is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. And in John 14, 16, we see that it is the Father who sends the Holy Spirit. It is the Father who sends the Holy Spirit. How is the Father involved in the salvation of sinners? He planned redemption. He elected believers. He sent His Son to the earth. He crushed His Son at the cross. He raised His Son from the dead, and He sent the Holy Spirit. Next, how do we see the Son involved in the redemption of sinners. Well, the Son obeyed the Father. John 6, 38. I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. The Father sent him, the Son obeyed, the Son came. And then we know that Jesus, the Son, died as a substitute. Listen to 1 Peter. Peter. Chapter 3, verse 18. Christ died for sins once for all time, the just in the place of the unjust to bring us to God. What was Jesus' involvement in our salvation? He was the one who went to the cross, the innocent substitute in the place of sinners to actually pay for sin in order to bring us to his Father. We see also that Jesus is the one who satisfied the wrath of his Father. Romans 3, 25, God displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Right? We covered that word propitiation when we read the dictionary a couple of weeks ago. Propitiation is the satisfaction of divine wrath by a substitute. Jesus was that satisfaction. 
He absorbed in totality the wrath of the Father against the sins of everyone who would ever believe, past, present, and future. So that when Jesus absorbs all of that wrath, there is not a single ounce of wrath left. He has drunk to the dregs all that God had in his anger against our sin. That anger is gone. Totally eradicated because Jesus absorbed it all in himself at the cross. And then, of course, Jesus raised himself from the dead. Look at John 10, verse 17. Jesus says there, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Listen, there is no one like Jesus. No one died like Jesus, gave up his spirit. Nobody else does that. Everybody else's last breath, termination point in their earthly mortality, is completely and totally due to God having, having numbered his days. Jesus freely releases his inner man from his outer man. And Jesus, all by himself, walked out of his tomb. He took up his life again. Nobody gets to do that. Lazarus needed supernatural intervention. And all of us need God to raise us from the dead physically on resurrection day. But Jesus took up his, laid down his life and took it up himself. And then Jesus is the one who raises believers from the dead. John 6, verse 40. This is the will of my Father that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. What is the son's role in the salvation of sinners? He obeyed the father. He died as a substitute. He satisfied the wrath of his father. He rose from the dead, and he raises believers from the dead. And what is the spirit's role in our salvation? Well, first of all, the spirit raised the son from the dead. Again, back to 1 Peter 3.18. Christ also died for sins once for all, the just in the place of the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Um, that can be translated made alive by the spirit, that isn't by the Holy Spirit. The, the reality that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all involved in the resurrection of the Son is a really interesting thing to behold. I'll never forget Jeff Walnoffer. Jeff Walnoffer was a 19-year-old neo-Nazi skinhead punk that got overruled by the grace of God, transferred from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of God's light and his son. Uh, he used to um, show up at his school, very rough school in Southern California, and say all the dirty words to all the people who were not of an Aryan complexion <laughs> and get beat up for it all the time. And then God saved him. And then he couldn't help telling about the grace of God in his life to anybody that would listen. So he would drive me around in his bright red 1974 Volkswagen Beetle with huge subwoofers, and he'd blast Keith Green through the streets of Redlands, California, and then some Christian speed metal too. But Keith Green and then speed metal back and forth, and he would jump out of this car with a hat on backwards that said, after religion, try Jesus, and he'd hand out tracts to anybody that would take them, and he'd say, do you know Jesus? Oh, lights turning green, gotta go. <laughs> and he would take me with him everywhere he went and he just showed me what it was like to be bold and courageous for Jesus because he was so overwhelmed at God's grace in his life. I'll never forget at one of those intersections, uh, he interacted with a Jehovah's Witness uh, who said, yeah, you're a Christian, you, you, you believe in the Trinity, that's bunk. <laughs> and, and, and Jeff said, well, who raised Jesus from the dead? And then he quoted three verses. God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus raised Jesus from the dead. And the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. What are you going to do with that, huh? And then he drove off. <laughs> 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 it, 
It is interesting to see all three members of the Trinity, separate persons, one God, operating together to accomplish the salvation of sinners. This is a remarkable feature of our salvation. The Holy Spirit is involved in raising the Son from the dead. He is also involved in regenerating, John 6, 63. It is the Holy Spirit who brings new life. It is the Holy Spirit who raises the dead spiritually, causing us to go from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing, Jesus said. It is the Spirit who indwells us, Romans chapter 8. If you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you're not in Christ. The Spirit dwells in us and leads us to put to death the deeds of the body. We are a temple of the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit who indwells. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it is the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us. That is, sets us apart progressively from one glory to another glory, progressively conforming us into the image of of Jesus. And it is the Spirit, Ephesians 1.13, who seals believers unto the day of salvation. What is the Spirit's role in our salvation? He raised the Son from the dead, He regenerates believers, He indwells, sanctifies, and seals all those who believe. When we see the interactions of Father and Son and Holy Spirit and the salvation of sinners, we, we recognize that God is up to something in His inner Trinitarian activity that transcends us. That leads us to the third point we're looking at this morning, and we want to see intra-Trinitarian relationships in the salvation of sinners. That is, what's going on between the Father and the Son? What's going on between the Son and the Spirit? What's going on between the Father and the Spirit in the salvation of sinners? And what does it reveal to us about God's purposes? Well, let's look together, beginning in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and verse 37. All that the Father gives me, Jesus says, will come to me. The one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Notice that the Father is giving to the Son a people. The Father is giving to the Son as a gift a group of sinners who are to be redeemed by the Son. And the Son is to pay for them at the cross, that is, redeem them, deliver the purchase price necessary to win them out of slavery to sin. And Jesus will raise those up on the last day. He will pay for their sins and he will grant them resurrection so that they will be fitted, inner man, outer man, body and soul, for an eternity of redeemed humanity before his Father in glory. So the Father gives the Son a people. The Son redeems those people, raises those people unto glory to give back to the Father for His praise. In a very real sense, we believers are a love gift from the Father to the Son as a bride because the Father loves the Son. And we are given as a love gift, purchased and resurrected in glory from the Son to the Father for the Father's glory and praise. Look at John chapter 10. Verse 14. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. Notice the relationship between intertrinitarian love, intertrinitarian knowledge, that, that knowing there is a relational knowledge and intimate love, 
and the bringing in of sheep. Jesus is the shepherd who will bring in sheep, but that flows out of the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father. You recognize this points us to the ultimate source of love. If, if you and I have love for one another, uh, of anything we're talking about, that is because we have love for God, right? A love for God overflows in, in our hearts and from our hearts to love for one another. But if you and I have love for God, why do we have that? Not that we first loved Him, but why? He loved us. So we have love for one another because we have love for God, but we only have love for God because God had love for us. And why does God have love for us according to this text? Because God has love for God. There's something going on in intra-Trinitarian relationships that overflows in love towards us. And oh, do we benefit. What a good thing it is to be loved by God with this infinite love that the infinite Father has for His infinite Son, overflowing into our finite situations which cannot contain such love. John 10, 29, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So, who is keeping believers? The Son is and the Father is. The protection and the preservation of this redeemed people for God's glory is an expression of inter-Trinitarian love. The protection, the preservation, the, the finishing of that work is in the Son's hand and the Father's hand. Turn to John 17. This is in the middle of Jesus' last evening with his disciples in the upper room. He spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. And and we just read Isaiah 48, where God says he would not share his glory. He's peerless. And here the Son is requesting that he is glorified in that sense of God's peerless glory. It is right for Jesus to be glorified as the God-man. Verse 2, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is remarkable. We understand why sinners are saved. The Father is giving something to the Son, and the Son is eager to be glorified, even as the Father is in glory. And the Son has authority over all flesh, so that all that the Father gives Him, they may have eternal life. There is a a logical consequence here. Every single person whom the Father gives to the Son, every single one of those, no one falls through the cracks. The Son gives eternal life. And then what's the definition of eternal life? That they may know you and the one whom you've sent. What is eternal life all about? That that we, the sinners, got a blank slate and forgiveness of sin and we can walk around in eternity with that blank slate and go, look, look at me, got no sin. No, our sinlessness qualifies us to be in the very presence of God that we might know Him. And how long will it take for finite creatures to know the infinite Trinitarian God? Forever. Right, if you could travel from earth all the way across the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy, take you 100 to 200,000 years at 186,000 miles per second, And if you could travel from the Milky Way galaxy to the farthest reaches of the known invisible universe. And if you did all of that at one mile an hour. At the end of all of that time, you will not have exhausted in your finite mind the beauties and the glories of the radiation of the sum total of the attributes of the infinite God of the Bible. That just means heaven's not going to be boring. 
to know him, to delight in him, to be wrapped up in the love that exists between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that then overflows into finite creatures to experience the knowledge of such a God for all of eternity means you will never get to the end. What a thrilling privilege. John 17, 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Speaking specifically of the, the 11 there. In verse 9, I ask on their behalf, and I do not ask of the world, on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. This is a very select group that experiences this love. And John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. There it is at the very bottom. What is the, what is the source of all of this redemptive plan of God? What is his love for humanity? What is the source of it? What is his love for believers manifested in this salvific program? It comes from God's love for the Son, the Son's love for the Father. Inner Trinitarian love is the basis of God's work. Of course, Jesus goes on to say in verse 20 of John 17, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, meaning the 11, the 12 minus Judas, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. What do we see in all of this? That salvation is bigger and grander than we often think. We get recalibrated in our thoughts that this isn't first and foremost about me. Oh, it certainly includes me. It involves every ounce of me but it is, I am not the termination of soteriology. I'll never forget when uh, uh, Janet and I were not yet quite dating. I don't know if you understand what I mean by that. I thought we were dating. She didn't think we were dating. Um, we drove up to a, a local mountain together and, and went snowboarding. Um, and Southern California snowboarding is um, a rare treat when it's good. Uh, this was one of those good days uh, nobody was there, there were no lift lines, and it was a whiteout blizzard. There was already knee-deep snow on the ground, and it just kept piling up. This is one of those epic days in Southern California where you just say, wow, and you don't eat lunch, you don't stop for snacks, you just burn runs. Just get up the lift and go do it again. Get up the lift and go do it again. And we, we got to the top of the lift, and, and Janet is sharing things that she's learning in her graduate program at the Master's University, and I'm sharing things I'm learning in seminary. And then we were both reflecting on a sermon that John MacArthur delivered on this topic of inner Trinitarian love as the source, as the foundation of God's love for sinners. I'd never heard anything like it. And it, it fundamentally altered my view of salvation. And here we are on this epic day, get as many runs in as you can, and we got off the lift, and you have to buckle in your snowboard boots into your bindings, and we just sat there in the snow. And I'll never forget the, the snow just sort of piled up on top of us because we weren't moving. We were just sitting, talking, and then in silence, and then talking some more, and then in silence again, thinking about God's love for us. And you know, the reality of meditating on these truths is it doesn't make us feel less loved by God. Wait, 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 I'm not the center of the universe? I'm not the center of God's love? Oh, well, then I don't want anything to do with it. No, we feel far more secure in the love of God because it isn't about me. It can't be forfeited when I don't quite measure up. God's love for sinners is rooted in something far better, far more secure, frankly, something far more lovely than little old me. And it is good to be small. It is good for God to be big, 
think about reversing that. If any one of us were out of proportion in the universe and God were diminished, that would be the end of all things. It would be bad for everyone. But for God to get all praise, for God to get all glory, is not some sort of ugly selfishness as if we would do it. It is appropriate and right for God to receive all glory, just as he has proclaimed in his word. He does all things according to his purpose for the praise of the glory of his grace. That is right for God. Anything short of that would be idolatrous, as if something else were worthy of that attention. And anything short of that would be disastrous for the universe. That something besides God would be the terminus of all honor and praise and glory. Turn to Psalm 57. If Robert Murray McShane is telling you what to read in your Bible and you're on schedule, you perhaps read this this morning. We'll close with this song. Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me. For my soul takes refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. God will send forth his loving kindness and truth. My soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit for me. They themselves have fallen into the midst of it. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. Oh Lord, that is our prayer, that as we think about salvation, as we think about our salvation, as we think about you hearing our groans and our cries and our sighs and our complaints before you, that you give attention, you heed the cries of your people, you have compassion, you have pity upon us in a miserable state, you look down on us in love, and that love springs from your love for you, and no love could be more secure than that. And our response is merely to be small, to be humble, to praise you in gratitude, and to say, let your glory be above all the heavens, beyond the universe. Let our praises be in accord with your design that we would honor you, that we would glorify you, that we would say truly from you and through you and to you are all things to you be the glory forever. Amen. It is by the power of your spirit and because of the work of your son and for your glory, O oh Father, that we can say these things. And so we say it in your name. Amen.